Greetings, Forth family. It is great to be with you again today on another Sunday. Uh, before we get into the message again today, I just want to remind you that uh, we are supporting Gary and Rachel as our missionaries of the month. Gary and Rachel are serving in Guatemala, and hopefully you've been seeing some of the things we've sent out over the last two weeks in terms of an update, uh, a link to an article on Kuiper's website, and even a little two-minute clip in our recent Fourth Good News uh, video blog. So uh, check those out. Remember to be supporting them. You can mail in a check at any point uh, over the next couple weeks, uh, or you can give through our online giving portal. Uh, either way, uh, but we would really encourage you to be financially supporting Gary and Rachel, praying for them, and and, and above that, I would even ask that you think about sending them a, an encouraging note via Facebook or an email just, just to lift their spirits as they've also been going through a lot in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, so Gary and Rachel, Missionary of the Month, keep them on your radar. As we get ready now to open the Word of God together, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for moving in our midst. We thank you for your generous love and mercy. And God, as we look at this text today and think about what it means to be overturned, I just ask God that you would do a work in our heart to prepare us uh, to live out of grace and mercy, which you so richly provide. Father, we pray this all in your name. Amen. If you're a gardener, and I'm not, by the way, I've stepped in a couple times for Julie to do some gardening, but it has largely not gone well. Uh, I can keep a plant alive for a little bit, but that's about it. But if you're a gardener, then you know that this time of year is when uh, people start to turn their soil over. Uh, I've watched as the community gardeners are working their soil right now, flipping it over, getting it loose again. Lance has been telling the field like crazy in between rainstorms, and, and all of that is for a purpose. Uh, over the winter and, and even really through the growing season, as people walk on it, the ground gets kind of compacted and hardened. And, and so the soil needs to be turned over to be loosened so that there is space and, and freedom really for the seed to have its roots go out into the soil easily, to, to really build a firm foundation and to produce new life. It's, it's in this image of overturning that our text actually brings us today. Uh, as you know, we've been in Jonah for a few weeks, and, and we've seen in chapter 1, Jonah gets this call from God, and he immediately runs away from God. We saw how Jonah interacted with the sailors, and that really wasn't great. And the sailors showed him up in many ways as they, as they, as they looked to God at the end of that passage and vowed to serve him. Last week, we saw Jonah in the belly of the fish praying to God and, and at least a semi-repentance for what he had done. And, and now today, after all of that's taken place, we see God come back to Jonah one more time with a message to go to Nineveh. And, and we're going to look at what that message is, and it includes this idea of being overturned. We're going to see how that worked in Nineveh, and, and we're going to wrestle with what it means for us as well. So, so without further ado, let's read the text, Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from the throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with his compassion. Turn from his fierce anger, so we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. This passage begins almost identically to Jonah chapter 1. 
God tells Jonah to go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim a message. The, the difference this time is that in chapter 1, when God says this, he says, because their wickedness has come up before him. But, but God, doesn't rep, uh, God doesn't say the wickedness piece again. He just says, arise and go, Jonah, head to Nineveh. I'm going to give you a message along the way, essentially. And so this time, Jonah responds obediently. He gets up and he begins his long trek to Nineveh, likely wondering what the message would be uh, and maybe even uh, maybe even wondering what he should do. And he had plenty of time to think about it. The trek to Nineveh was long. Uh, from what we can tell, it would have been about 500 miles from the Jerusalem area to the city of Nineveh. And, and that's about the same as driving from here to Des Moines, Iowa. I know, Des Moines, why would anyone go to Des Moines? But it's the same distance, so that's the point. The difference, of course, being that to go to Nineveh, Jonah didn't have a vehicle. He wouldn't have been able to make it in a day. In fact, uh, depending on his walking pace, it likely, I would guess, took him around two weeks to get there. Two weeks of walking and wondering and reflecting. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he had some thought again of running or or tried to figure out at least what to do. maybe, Maybe his anxiety building as he got near the city. Again, the Assyrians were the enemies of Israel. They were they were savage people who were known for all kinds of heinous violence. Jonah didn't want to go there. And he had all kinds of time to let that anxiety build. When he had finally arrived at Nineveh, he had more walking to do. The, the city of Nineveh, by what we can tell through archaeology, was about seven and a half miles in perimeter. Now, that's actually not a super huge distance, but the text tells us that it took three days' journey to go through the city. Now, why would that be? Part of what we think is is that it took Jonah three days because he had to go to all the little town squares in the city and and get people together to proclaim this message. It would have taken time to get to all those locations and to speak this truth and then move on and keep the process going. There was roughly 120,000 people in Nineveh who, who needed to hear somehow this message that God was providing. I can almost imagine Jonah getting ready to get up in the first town square to proclaim the message from God. Again, filled with some anxiety, not knowing how the Assyrian people would would react, wondering what would happen to him next. And yet he gets up and God gives him this message and and he proclaims, probably loudly yelling, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now, the text doesn't tell us if, if he had called the, Ninev- the Ninevites to get their attention. Uh, we don't know if they stopped in their tracks at hearing this. Uh, we don't know if they asked him any questions. All we know is this, and this is amazing. The text tells us they heard the message and believed God. Now, there's some historical evidence that leads us to this point where we can understand Maybe why they would even believe this message from Jonah. Uh, Apparently, in uh, around this time that Jonah would have gone there, uh, Assyria and Nineveh in particular had experienced some plagues. They had experienced some pestilence. It's possible they had experienced some natural phenomena, even like an earthquake or hail or like bad storms. In other words, God had been setting the table for this message. The Ninevites didn't know about the God of Israel, but they had gods they worshipped. And so it wouldn't surprise me if they were attributing all of this to one of their gods. And then when Jonah came with a message from his God to proclaim that the city was about to be overturned, it would have shook them because they would have seen some of the signs that were coming. And so they believe. They believe. And they act accordingly. It's really fascinating to see what they do, right? They declare a fast and everyone from the least of the people to the greatest of the people stops eating. They put on sackcloth and they begin to call out for help. Now sackcloth was apparently a fabric that was made of something like goat's hair. It doesn't sound very comfortable to wear, at least not to me, but it was something that people wore in ancient Near Eastern times as a sign of mourning and a sign of submission. In other words, the Ninevites were humbling themselves before God. Now, now what's what's cool 
to me at least about this is that I really think there's authenticity in their actions. A lot of times in a situation like this, a king would hear the news first and a king would make a decree, and we'll see this in a moment, telling the people what to do and how to respond. And the people would go through the motions, but it didn't necessarily mean that they felt it in their hearts. But because this action starts with the people first, you get a sense that they really do believe that something is about to happen to them and they take the initiative. It's like a grassroots movement to respond. Eventually, we find out that the king does hear. We don't know how long it took for the news to really get to him, but eventually uh, the news got to the king and the king responded like his people. He got up from his royal throne. It says he took off his royal robes. He also put on sackcloth and then he sat in the dust. He sat in the dust. The king, who was in many ways leading the wickedness, had humbled himself as well. He too embraced these outward signs of fasting and sackcloth and sitting in the dust as a sign of submission and mourning. But the king didn't stop there. He did what other ancient Near Eastern kings would have done. He issued a decree with his royal nobles to the people. And essentially what he did was intensify the actions the people were already doing. He declared that no person or beast should eat or drink anything. So so imagine this, right? The people are already fasting, but now the king says the animals should fast too. And then he talks about sackcloth, right? The people are already wearing sackcloth, but he wants the animals to wear sackcloth too. And and it almost seems pretty comical. But, But I think what the king is doing is trying to make it clear that all of the living creatures in Nineveh we're, under the, we're going to be submitting to this God. And they were joining together in mourning. The king tells the people to call out to God for help. And I think what's interesting is this. If the animals were not being fed, it doesn't take animals long. If they're not fed to, to start really making a lot of noise, they start to cry out as well because they're hungry and they're looking for food. And so there's a sense as the people are crying out that the animals, because of a lack of food, would have been crying out as well. And the noise, some scholars think, would have been deafening. There is this huge cry to God. In the midst of the decree, the king also tells the people to give up their evil ways and their wickedness. Their violence, actually, is what he says. And what's fascinating here is that most scholars will agree that the wickedness and the evil that the king is referring to is not necessarily the wickedness and evil that Assyria has perpetuated on other countries. Instead, this is wickedness and evil from person to person in the city of Nineveh. They had developed a class system of sorts, and people treated each other poorly. There was violence inside the city from person to person, and it's this violence, internal violence in the city, that God seems to really be going after them for. And so the king says it's time to stop this violence. What's cool in the midst of this, and again, we don't really know how long the fast lasts. It could have been 40 days. It could have been shorter. We're we're just not sure. There's no context really for it. But what we know is this, the king, in the midst of this fast, in the midst of this calling out, in the midst of this idea that they should turn from their violence, has hope, a little bit at least, in a God he doesn't know, that perhaps that God will relent and not send destruction upon them. Now, I opened the sermon today with this illustration of a farmer or a gardener overturning their soil, right? Tilling it and preparing it for new life to grow. And and I want to come back to that now because, again, the message that Jonah gives Nineveh is this. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned. Now, the Hebrew word here is actually for overturned is uh, hafak. I think I'm saying that right. Overturned is this word that we read, and especially in the context and, and everything we've seen in Jonah, you get, the, you get the sense, and especially even from the way the Ninevites respond, that overturned means destruction. It means that in 40 days, Nineveh is about to be judged and condemned and destroyed. 
And this is, again, uh, this is a very valid way of interpreting this word. But the word hafak is more complex than that. Jonah would have known it. Hafak can mean to simply turn or to change. And so Jonah comes in and he says, For, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overturned. And the reality is this. If Nineveh had ignored Jonah or brutally murdered him, as they've been known to do with other people, they would have been overturned through God's judgment and destruction. But instead, and this is wild, Nineveh was overturned through submission and grief. What, what seems to be true here is this. Jonah's prophecy was not just a prophecy about future judgment. It wasn't just a warning. It was also a statement that was fulfilled in the actions of the Ninevites as they changed their ways. They overturned their ways. I love this play on the word overturn and the way it actually takes place. I've read the story a number of times and I've never thought about the fact that Nineveh actually is overturned at the end of chapter 3. And what's cool here is this. God responds to the overturning of Nineveh with their change in behavior, with their submission to him, by also turning from destruction of Nineveh to compassion. Now, there's one thing I want to tell you this week that I learned that I just thought was pretty amazing. And, and it may seem a little bit out of left field, but bear with me. It has to do with this chapter in Jonah and Israel's most important holy day, the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was this day that was set aside every year where through rituals and sacrifice and liturgy, God would atone for the sins of the people. And so the day, the day has all kinds of things that take place. You can actually read about this in the book of Leviticus. But I'm just going to give you a small synopsis of a few things that happen. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take two goats. And he would cast lots in between the goats. And one goat would have the lot cast for death. That goat would be sacrificed on an altar in the, in, the, in the temple or in the tabernacle, depending on the time. And in that sacrifice, the blood would be taken. It would be sprinkled over the tabernacle. It would be sprinkled throughout the Holy of Holies as a method of atoning for the rebellion and the wickedness and the sinfulness of Israel. When the high priest was done with this sacrifice and sprinkling of the blood, he would come out of the temple or the tabernacle and he would, he would take the other goat, put both hands on that goat's head, and then he would confess the sin and the wickedness and the rebellion of Israel over that goat. Then he would take that goat or then somebody was elected to take the goat into the wilderness where that, that goat was to be set free. And it was a scapegoat that took the sins of the people with it into the wilderness where it was removed from them. So you have this atonement that happens in blood. And then you have this substitutionary atonement as the goat takes on the sins of the people and is cast off and away from the people and the presence of God. Now, this is all amazing, but in later day, years, as the people would practice this Day of Atonement, they adopted the book of Jonah as part of the liturgy for the day. In fact, they specifically focused on Jonah chapter 3, which ironically is this chapter about their enemies repenting and coming uh, under, under the authority of God. And so, so in this chapter, it would be read throughout the day of the Day of Atonement, and the people would reflect on it. And as I studied that this week and tried to get my hat around why that was, uh, there's a couple things that I learned through some reading of some articles. And, and one is, that the, is this. They would read Jonah, specifically Jonah chapter 3, because it would remind the people of Israel of God's mercy. Jonah reminded them that if God could forgive Nineveh in all of its wickedness and sin, then he could forgive them too as God's chosen people. They also read Jonah chapter 3 uh, as a reminder of what true repentance looks like. Think about that for a moment. The people of Israel were looking at the Ninevites 
as an example for what repentance and submission actually look like. Because in the Ninevites, there is this model of people who really do set their hearts before God, submit to him, mourn over their wickedness, and and turn from their evil, at least for a time. Israel looking to Nineveh as a role model. And then finally, part of this inclusion is just a reminder that God answers prayer. God answers the prayer of the Ninevites. God answers the prayer of Jonah. God answers the prayer of the sailors. It's a reminder that God answers prayers when we cry out to him in our need. Seriously, it blows my mind that the enemies of Israel, who Jonah despised, and as we'll see next week, really didn't care for even after they repented, became an example for them on the day where they celebrated their freedom from sin. Now, here's here's where we need to go for us. As we think about the Day of Atonement, as we think about the Ninevites and their response to the message in Jonah chapter 3, we need to also think about our sin. And I want us to understand this, as we think about the Ninevites especially. We belong to a God who has compassion, forgiveness, and mercy that is unlimited. For us today, we don't need to go through the ritual of the Ninevites where where we we strip off our clothes and put on sackcloth and sit in the dust and and do this long fast and mourn. Uh, We don't have to go through what the Israelites went through with this Day of Atonement and sacrificing goats and sending them into the wilderness. We simply need Jesus. You see, we serve a Jesus who humbled himself to the mission of God the Father, and left heaven to to live in the ashes or the dust, if you will, of our sin and rebellion. Jesus humbled himself even further, allowing himself to be beaten and mocked and hung on a cross. Jesus uh, was our atonement. Jesus, through his blood, was atonement for our sin. His blood was shed to break the curse of sin. Jesus was also the lamb that was exiled into the wilderness of death as a scapegoat for our wickedness. Through Jesus, we experience all of God's compassion and mercy and forgiveness. In Jesus, and you need to hear this, in Jesus there is no condemnation for you or for me. Look, I don't care what sin you've committed. I don't care what bad thing you've done that you think is too big for God. It is not ever too big for God. God can forgive you. God does forgive you. He has done everything for your forgiveness and atonement in Jesus. You are never too far gone for God's mercy. You are never too messed up to receive forgiveness. In Jesus our lives are actually overturned. Because of everything Christ has done, there is a work of new life in us. Jesus has overturned the curse of sin and death, absolutely. But he's also overturning our hearts every day as he works through his Holy Spirit to make us new. Jesus is tilling up the soil of our hard hearts and breaking it loose so that seeds of humility, submission, grace, and love can grow freely. Jesus is working in all of us to overturn us and make us new in him. And so this leaves me with some questions that I have for myself, but also for you in the week ahead. As you think about your life, as you think about the message of grace that Jesus has provided for you, as you think about the work that he wants to do in you, what in your life needs to be overturned by Jesus? And and what areas of of your life do you need to submit to Jesus in new ways? What are some sins in your life that you are just clinging on to? either out of control or desire or something else that you just need to let Christ overturn and remove. People of God, let the love of Jesus 
change your heart today. Let him overturn your sinfulness and let his grace take up root. Jesus overturned everything when he went to the cross. He overturned the curse of sin. He overturned the curse of death. And he desires to continue the work of overturning you so you can keep becoming more and more like him. So people of God, today is a great day to submit to the overturning grace of Jesus. Let's go to him and let's be made new. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your compassion and your mercy. We thank you for the way that you work to to, uh, even help the Ninevites understand who you are. And Lord, we see in a moment that they, that they, do, they do mourn for their wickedness and they do submit to you and they, they even talk about turning away from, from the evil in their lives. And God, we don't know how long this change of heart lasted, but we know that there was a moment of change and we see your compassion on wicked people and we're grateful. God, we're grateful that you're a God who has compassion on all of us in our sin. God, you have every right to come, uh, to come at us with your, with your wrath and with judgment, but instead you come at us with Jesus. And Father, we're so grateful for that. We're grateful for the mercy he provides. Father, will you do the work of overturning the sinfulness in our life? Will you do the work of helping us to have our hard hearts broken and and softened for you? Will you cleanse us and renew us? Because God, we need you to do that work today so that we can be more like your son. Father God, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now people of God, go from here today to live in the power of an overturned life that is filled with the seeds of the gospel of Jesus. And may you grow into his likeness with every passing minute. Amen.